Good evening, everyone. It's a blessing to be able to gather here together with you this evening to, again, open up another portion of God's Word. If you would this evening, take out your Bibles and follow along with us. We'll be starting there back in the book of Genesis to start out, but we'll be turning to a number of passages this evening and looking at a few different biblical examples, talking about the subject of the idea and really the idea that your past doesn't have to define you. More often than not, when you talk to folks, they like to kind of label people into a group or into a category, and usually that's based on things they've done or things they have not done at different periods of their life. And we'll talk about people that are liars, that are murderers, that are good people, that are wealthy. We'll talk about things they've done or not done throughout their history, and that kind of gets to be something that follows you for the rest of your life. Well, when you look at God's Word, you can see that sometimes that is the case, but it's only ever really the case for the most part in God's Word when someone does something and they keep up that pattern as long as they're alive, as long as they draw breath, whether that be something that is good or whether that be something that is evil. But the idea that we can take a mistake, we can take a sin, we can take something done that is wrong and it follows us for the rest of our life and there's nothing we can do to get rid of it, is absolutely not something that is found in God's Word. So I want to look at three key examples this evening of some folks in the Bible that you and I may think of as faithful. In fact, we'll look at Hebrews 11 a couple times this evening. God considers faithful, but they did some pretty awful and heinous things as far as the Scripture is concerned and as far as things are done to other people that have been forgiven and wiped away, and that's not how they're best remembered. So let's begin there with two people that kind of started the Jewish people and the first promises were made to Abraham and Sarah. And for the most part, we think of Abraham and Sarah as kind of being the father and mother of the Jewish people. They were the start through them. It's Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then all of Israel came about. Abraham and Sarah, for the most part, are known to be very righteous people throughout the history of scriptures, but they definitely had their problems and they definitely had their sins that I wonder how long it followed them as they were walking about in the land of Canaan at the time. Abraham and Sarah, for a while, did a, not just a lie, they did a bitty, pretty big lie, as far as lies are concerned, by lying straight to a ruler of an area of Canaan. In Genesis chapter 20, we'll back up to verse 1 to get the context. Abraham and Sarah journeyed there to the south and dwelt near Kadesh and Shur, and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Get the emphasis there that we seem to see that not only is this one time it's happened, it actually happened multiple times with Abraham and Sarah, that he lies straight to a king or a ruler or some kind of prince or someone that is ruling an area about the fact that Sarah is not his wife and the reason being he's given, he was afraid. Sarah was a very beautiful woman, even up until her old age, and he thought, it's very likely someone will kill me so that they can take Sarah to be my wife. So we have both conspired together to lie because we are afraid, kind of the opposite of what we talked about this morning, that God cannot protect us. So we're through going to, through deceit and through lies, endanger the lives of other people, of other families, and other countries by putting forth a lie and spreading it. You skip on now to the end of this account in Genesis chapter 20, picking up there in verse 11, though. Abraham, giving reason for this, said, Because I thought surely uh, the fear of God is not in this place. They will kill me on account of my wife, but indeed she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, This is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. Over and over, they repeated this lie as they continued to walk about, as they continued to walk about this land of Canaan and the land of people that for the most part were not God-fearing people. Abraham should have been an example of what it meant to serve God, as he is really throughout the rest of Scripture. But here in these moments, Abraham and Sarah both had really a terrible reputation, and in many countries that they pulled this, and it was found out, they were driven out of the country, and they were left with a reputation that they were never allowed to enter that country again because of the sin that they had committed. 
You skip forward, we won't even do that this evening. You go to Isaac. Isaac tries to enter the country of where Abimelech is ruling here. He's not even allowed to enter the country once they realize who Isaac is and who his father is. Because that reputation followed not only his father, it followed his son of someone that you're not going to allow to enter into this country because of the trouble that their sin has caused us. But it's interesting. They had these attitudes, and yet God still counts them to be these faithful people and examples in passages like Hebrews chapter 11. Back up a few pages to Hebrews chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 16 this time. They also presumed to kind of mock God to his face and presumed to know better in Genesis chapter 16. We'll read verse 1 and 2 for context. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Now Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, and perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. I'm sorry, Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. After God had already told them a couple of chapters prior that, Sarah, you're going to have a child. Abraham, through your loins, through Sarah, your wife, you guys are both going to have a child. And these blessings of the land, the seed, and the nation are going to come upon you and your descendants. They decide, nope, we've got better plans than God. We're going to let my master go into my maidservant and have a child through her. And look at the history of not only what happened in the near future of the jealousy and the anger that happens between Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael. What happens generations down the line in Ishmael's family becomes constant enemies of God and God's people and constantly at war with the Israelites. And in many ways, their descendants are still fighting over in the Middle East to this day. You look at these two people, and it's thankful that we serve a God who says no matter what you've done, no matter what evil you have committed, that doesn't have to follow you for the rest of your life or for the rest of eternity. What God remembers is not the sin they did in the moment and that he would later forgive. What he remembers is summed up in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning there in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 8, reads, If you are without change... I'm sorry, that's chapter 12. Chapter 11 and verse 8, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of that place, which he would receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going, and by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. What God remembers them for is leaving their friends and their family, going to a foreign nation, not living there among them as if we're just going to settle down and be here, living as sojourners for multiple generations, as people without a permanent home, on the promise that you will receive something greater in the future. What God remembers of Abraham and Sarah is the trust that they placed in him. Verse 10 continues, For he waited for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham and Sarah are remembered as examples, not just for the Old Testament and for the Israelites, they're remembered as examples for us as Christians. That they looked and said, This world is not my home. You have a better one waiting for me in the future. You are preparing one yourself, God, and that is where we want to go. We are putting our full trust in you, and just as you have forgiven us of our sins that we have committed in the past. Their faith was tested, and sometimes they failed, but most often they passed. Hebrews chapter 11, kicking up in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, he who had received the promises offered up by his only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. When Abraham and Sarah are tested, as it continues on, they're found over and over to be satisfactory, to be faithful people that trusted in God. 
that desired a better country, as verse 16 states. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has a city prepared for them. This is the example that we see throughout Scripture. I wonder at times when Isaac tries to enter into the same country as his father and is kicked out because of his father's lies and lack of faith. I wonder if Isaac felt shame because of that. I wonder if the Israelites, generations down the line, were afraid to tell the stories of Abraham and of Sarah when Sarah laughed when God told her, you're going to be pregnant with child. I wonder if they were ashamed to tell of the accounts of their lack of faith when they struggled and when they sinned. God left them for us, left them for the children of Israel, so that we might remember that our past doesn't have to define us. The sins and the mistakes that we make don't have to follow us for all of eternity. They can be forgiven and we can still be remembered by God as righteous servants of His. Hebrews chapter 11, this time backing up to verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars and the sky and multitude, immeasurable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having them seen them afar off, were assured of them embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. It's for these attitudes that Abraham and Sarah are not remembered for the sinful actions they committed. They're remembered for their righteousness and for their faith in their God. But another interesting example, if you turn back to Judges, is one of my favorite judges for many reasons. And that has to really do with the fact that Gideon is a very unique case, unlike most of the other judges. Some of them just have a couple snippets about them, and we don't know much and can't know much about them. Some of them have big accounts dedicated to them, and Gideon is one of the ones that has a larger account dedicated to him. But Gideon is not who you might typically think of a hero or a judge or a savior of Israel. He's not the action hero that Samson was. He's not cunning like Othniel was in hiding his dagger on his left side. He's not remembered for his actions like Samuel and his grand speeches. Gideon was a man of many, many flaws and many sins. But he isn't remembered as that in Hebrews chapter 11. He's remembered as a hero of faith. And get it in, or I'm sorry, in Judges chapter 6, we begin reading about 11, beginning in verse 11 down through verse 22. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash and at the Abiazite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go into the midst, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. The Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. And do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. So he answered, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread with an ephah of flour. The meat he put into a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and added them both under the terebinth tree, and presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, and lay them on this rock, and pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put put 
out the end of the staff that was in his hand, touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. The angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, and so Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. For the most part, Gideon's interactions go on to be repeatings of this first encounter with an angel of the Lord and with God speaking to him. When God comes to him, when God tells him to use his might, when God tells him to go and conquer the Midianites, when God tells him to go out and fight, he's not like other judges that took an ox goat and slayed 300 Philistines. He's not someone who goes and takes the jawbone of a donkey and goes into battle. He's not someone that catches foxes and ties them together and sets the fields on fire. He is a man who greatly struggles with faith and you can see it in his first words. Oh yeah? If God is with us, why are the Midianites here? Why have we been turned over into the enemy hands? Where is the God that rescued us out of Egypt with power and with plagues where is that god and who am i that i should even be that god's servant what use am i he reminds me very much of the moses that we talked about at the beginning of our lesson this morning in genesis 3 and 4 he's a man who struggles greatly with his faith with his faith and even at the end of chapter 6 he still wasn't satisfied with the meat and the bread that was put on the rock he sets out the fleece on three different occasions and god proves to him three different occasions on three different mornings i'm in control i still have the power he still works with gideon but still gideon's faith is one that throughout the rest of his account in the book of judges continues to struggle and weaken over and over and over again because if we could label anything Gideon with anything at this point we would probably label Gideon a coward he is a man that has no faith or very little faith and he is a man who is terrified of going of fighting and doing as God has just commanded him verse 25 of Judges chapter 6 now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him take your father's young bull the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. Build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice on the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took men from among his servants and did as the Lord said to him, but because he feared his father's household, and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. God tries to work with Gideon at first and says, okay, maybe taking on the entire army of Midian is too much for you right now. Step one, go and take down the altar of Baal that is in your own town. Gideon says, okay, I'll go and do it and I'll take some servants with me and I'll do as you command but I'm afraid of my father's household who worships this Baal. And I'm afraid of the city that primarily worships at this altar of Baal. So I'm going to do it sneakily in the night. Gideon is one that uses a lot of underhanded tactics and tries to worm his way around, in many cases, in his service to God and doing it in secret and not standing up for the truth. He eventually gets a lot better and does some great things in confronting not only the Midianites, but his own people that refused to come and help him, help him chase them down and destroy them as God commanded. Gideon was also a man that made some pretty awful mistakes. I don't believe this was done with malicious intent. He wasn't someone trying to leave behind an idol or to cause problems. But after Gideon has subdued the Midianites, after he has wiped them out, after he has done as God commands, In Judges chapter 8, verses 22 down through verse 27, the men of Israel come to Gideon and tell him, rule over us, be a judge, now we're ready to serve you. So Gideon sets himself up as a judge, as all the other judges have done, but he asks them to bring jewels and treasures, essentially as tribute to him. What Gideon does is make an ephod, he makes a breastplate. 
out of the jewels and the gold and the treasure that the children of Israel brought to him. And Judges chapter 8 recounts that after Gideon sets this up, verse 26 continuing. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains which were around the camel's neck. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Orpah. And all the children of Israel played the harlot with it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his household. He makes what I imagine to him was not meant to be an idol. It was meant to be a trophy of his battle. Maybe it was meant for something for him to look upon and remember. God is with me. God has helped me conquer. Midian has been conquered. Here is the spoils of them, and here is some treasures of the Israelites that brought to me as tribute. And we've turned it into this breastplate as something to be looked upon and as something to be remembered as a trophy but accidentally sets up an idol that becomes an issue not only for his own people, for his own city, but the Scripture recounts it becomes a snare to Gideon himself and his household. Gideon wasn't the smartest man. Gideon wasn't the wisest man. Gideon wasn't the strongest man or always made the best decisions. But God was patient with Gideon. God looked upon Gideon, and rather than judging him as maybe the rest of his countrymen might have judged him, or maybe the rest of his household might have judged him as being the weakest of his household. Most people say that means he was probably the youngest, had the least amount going to come to him and going to be given to him. He was the weakest of his household, but God said, no, I can still use you. Your past reputation, even your past actions, are not the defining character of what you will become. A man who in Judges chapter 7 will take a great army that is gathered together to you and who whittles it down and whittles it down till okay, I'll, I'll give you some clarity. You won't go fight the Midianites yourself. You'll go with 300 to go with you against an army far better equipped and with tens of thousands trying to fight you. And he even tells Gideon, you know what? You won't even go directly into combat with them. Not at first. You'll go to them at night and through some trickery and clever play make it sound as if enemies are crashing into the camp and wiping out the people. And they're going to wipe each other out for the most part. Then you're going to give pursuit and finish them off. Over and over, God is patient and God works with Gideon and God remembers Gideon in Hebrews chapter 11. Unlike Abimelech, as a righteous judge that served him faithfully. Hebrews chapter 11 there in verse 32. It's interesting of one of the few judges that are brought up by name in the book of Hebrews 11. In verse 32, Gideon is one of them. For what more shall I say? For time would fail to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, or of David, or of Samuel and the prophets. Gideon, Samson, and Samuel are the only prophet, or I'm sorry, the only judges that are even brought up here. Now he said, I could bring up more, I could discuss more here. I'm sorry, I guess I missed Jephthah there. I guess Jephthah's a judge as well. God's saying, I could bring up more and I could talk about more of their feats, but it's interesting that he says, listen, Gideon is someone who no matter what he did in the past, in the end, and as he faithfully lived and died, he was a faithful servant of mine. The cowardice was wiped away. The lack of faith was wiped away. The accidentally setting up an idol was wiped away. The sin was wiped away and he is remembered as a faithful servant who in a very hard time in Israel's history stood up for the truth, freed his people, and served his God. One more example I want us to look at back in the 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 for the most part, we remember David as a faithful man, as does God. Kind of the point of this lesson. But David is one who, even really unlike Gideon, or unlike Abraham or Sarah, we might consider, if we just took 2 Samuel 11 into context, 
as one of the most awful and wicked men throughout the entirety of Scripture. David does some truly horrendous and evil things here that very few other men or women in Scripture are recorded ever doing. First and foremost, if you know the account of 2 Samuel chapter 11, he's an adulterer. He puts himself in a position where the rest of his army is at war and he's back at home. His eyes come upon a woman who is bathing on the top of her roof. He thinks about her and he dwells on her and summons her in and finds out she's married, as he is as well, and commits adultery. But it doesn't stop there. David tries to cover it up. Once he finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, he tries to bring her husband back by the name of Uriah to, under pretense of congratulating Uriah on being such a good soldier, let Uriah go home to his wife, do as most soldiers would do with their wives after they've come home from combat, and hope that that would cover up this pregnancy. Uriah said, no, it's not right that I go home and sleep in my own bed and be with my own wife when my brethren are still out on the front lines, so I'm going to just sleep in a corner of the castle and I'll return back to the front lines tomorrow. When that doesn't work, David goes a step further in his deceit and commits murder. Not with his own hands, but by telling his generals, let Uriah go out onto the front lines and everyone else pull back from him so that he might die in combat. Then I can take Bathsheba to be my own. Then I can cover up this adultery. I can cover up this embarrassment. I can make all of this go away by just marrying Bathsheba and pretending nothing's wrong. I've seen supervillains in movies that have done less evil things than what David does in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Truly some evil things involving multiple people causing the death of of an innocent man and souls to be lost. And eventually the loss of his own child because of his sin. But again, it's a testament to what God looks at in you and me and in these men and women of faith that He doesn't just leave it there. Hebrews 11 and verse 32, For time would fail to tell me of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Here's the man that after Saul betrayed God, that Samuel told Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. David goes from being one of the people in scriptures that has done truly evil and harmful things to being someone that scripture continually records, not just like we studied this morning, a man who without fear stands before Goliath, but a man who repeatedly serves God, is faithful to him, tries his best, and spends his life in psalm, in service, and in worship of his God. And who God, in return, remembers as this faithful man who worked righteousness, who obtained promises, who stopped the mouths of lion, who quenched fire, who fought battles. He is remembered as this man who, although having done some very wicked and evil things, doesn't define him for the rest of his life and thankfully for the rest of eternity. Those things God forgives and wipes away David asks for it. So what about you this evening? I'm not worried about how the world defines you this evening. I'm worried about how God defines you this evening. What do you look like this evening? Are you someone who, like most of our examples, at some point, and maybe right now, have committed sin or are dwelling in sin? Even the names of some of the greatest, what we call heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, did some awful evil things. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Don't let that sin define you for the rest of your life. Take care of it this evening. Don't let that sin be what prevents you from being with God and in heaven and being called faithful by Him for all of eternity. Are you a liar like some of the examples that we looked at this evening like Abraham and Sarah and David? Has your conscience been seared as with a hot iron as 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2 talks about? Are you following after your father, the devil, who is the father of all lies as Christ talked about in John 8 and verse 44? If that is the case, you can make it right. It can be forgiven. No matter how long the lies have gone on, no matter how big the lies are, it can be wiped clean and remembered no more by our Father. Do you struggle with your faith? Do you ask questions like Gideon of why do certain things happen today? Why is evil allowed to continue? Why am I being called to serve God, to work in His kingdom, to do different things? I'm no one of great renown or report, and I'm not going to be able to accomplish much. Again, the message of the Scriptures is like in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, where Paul writes, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. The point of this lesson and examples like this is to try and encourage you and uplift you. It's a message from God that He's being patient with you. He's trying to help you if this is where you struggle. And that He can turn you into something great. By you, lives could be saved. Souls could be saved. Eternity could be saved and changed for the people that you and I talk to on a daily basis because of your actions when you allow God to work through you. The fear and the lack of faith and being afraid to talk to others and the anxiety and the lack of knowledge doesn't have to stop you. To God, you can be still called a faithful servant. Do you feel as if you've done something just absolutely unforgivable? I think for most people, especially in this day and age that likes to just throw people's names online and cancel them over anything and tell them they should never be allowed to work again or exist in Hollywood again or to never walk the face of the earth again and just, I mean, just outright absolutely hate people. I think if they'd have looked upon David, he would be one of the most despised men. And a story to be told to children is like a boogeyman. I imagine many of the brethren in Corinth would be treated such a way today by many people in the church and in the world. But it's amazing when you read 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9, most people stop at verse 10, but I think verse 11 is important for the context. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Paul is talking about here the very same things that we've been examining all evening. He's telling the Corinthian brethren what you've done in the past, who you are, these labels, these sins, do not have to follow you forever. Some of you have done things that will not only keep you out of the kingdom of heaven, some of us have done things that are absolutely evil and awful and have hurt many people around us. There are people that would call me horrendous and awful names, and there are probably some people you could find that would do the same to you because of some things that you've done in the past. But it's not supposed to be a label that sticks forever. 
It's not supposed to be something that keeps you out of heaven and ruins your eternity. Because God says He can still use you. But He said to me, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. God doesn't call perfect people. He doesn't call flawless people. He's not really a help to people who've never done anything wrong. As Jesus said in Mark 2 and verse 17, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. We have examples like Abraham and Gideon and David and so many others that time fails me tonight to talk about. Examples of people that you and I may know personally who have not let the sin and the labels and the wickedness follow them, but they have been washed. They have been cleansed and they have escaped that eternal label and that definition. They have been saved. If we continue in sin this evening, then that is a label that will follow us for all of eternity. It is a name that will follow us when we stand before God that He says, I don't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Our sinful present can define our eternity and give us a label. First, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we, have, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. In contrast to that, though, our righteous decisions today can also define how God remembers us and how we will be remembered in the scope of eternity. Hebrews 7 and verse 25 reads this way. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And again in Hebrews 8, beginning in verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. No matter what you or I have done, we can be useful to God. We can be pleasing to God and those evil things that we have done can be wiped away. But you have to want that and you have to pursue that. Either this evening by becoming a Christian, repenting and turning away from those sinful lifestyles and being baptized, or as a Christian who has done those things, who has gone back to that sin and gone back to Satan, by asking God for forgiveness, either privately or in prayer or publicly by coming forward and confessing those things, if it is something that has brought shame upon the name of His church. If that is the case this evening, whether you come forward and become a Christian or whether you need to make things right, we're here to help you, to pray for you, to help you in whatever way that we can. And if the need calls for it this evening, please come forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.